Ladies and gentlemen, the Railroad Hour. And here comes our star-studded show train. Tonight, the Association of American Railroads presents the great Broadway musical hit, Connecticut Yankee, starring Gordon McRae and his guest star, Jenny Sims. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and the music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. Yes, tonight, another great musical success is brought to you by the American Railroads, the same railroads that bring you most of the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the fuel you burn, and all the other things you use in your daily life. And now, here is our star, Gordon McRae. Thank you, Marvin Miller, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, tonight, I'll be Hank Barrett, the Connecticut Yankee, and Ginny Sims will play a couple of girls named Sandy. Now, we, uh, we don't expect you to believe that this story really happened, but wouldn't it be fun if it did? Mm-hmm. I ask you, Sandy, is there a law in the state of Connecticut that says you have to get married? Oh, Hank, I've got to go through with it. Well, then just change the starting lineup. Scratch the bridegroom and enter me instead. Oh, well, Mervyn would be mortified. Mervyn. How can you marry a guy who does parlor tricks? Well, mother likes him. Oh, Sandy, this isn't the dark ages. Nowadays, you don't marry to please your folks. You're supposed to follow your heart. I took one look at you. That's all I meant to do. And then my heart. Kiss me, Sandy. 
Mm. Oh, Hank. Well. Oh. Uh, hello, Mervyn. While I'm in the other room entertaining guests, I find this man kissing my future wife. Well, you're not the only one who does parlor tricks, Merv, old boy. Oh. You bounder, you thief, you... Mervyn, put down that bottle. Careful, Merv. <laughs> Hit me. What happened? Mm. Pretty fair, sir. Wilt ye do battle? Come again? Wilt ye try a passage of arms for land or lady? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Quit poking me with that stick, Sam. Say, uh, how long can you stay fresh in that can? Barlet, thou art the captain of Sir Sagramor de Azuras, light of King Arthur's table round. This guy's as nutty as a fruitcake. <laughs> now, look, Saggy. I don't know where I am or how I got here, but tell me one thing. What's the date? Verily, it is November the 27th. I mean, what's the year? Everyone in Britain knows the year. It is 528 A.D. Oh, brother. Thou lookest woebegone. Yeah, you'd lookest woebegone too, Saggy. I just slipped and skidded 14 centuries. <laughs> Where are we going, Saggy? What is this place? It is the banquet hall of the castle of Camelot. Well, who are all these jokers in the tin tuxedos? Verily, the knights of the table round. We drink the flagon today to kill the dragon today. We drink to fight and fight to drink the abundantly. <laughs> Here's the toast to the ale and the antelope. into a mess like this. Hey, Sandy! Speakest thou to me? Yeah, what are you doing in this lunatic asylum? Forsooth, thy words are passing strange. You know what? You look just like a girl I'm going to fall in love with about 1,400 years from today. Look, uh, what do they call you? Alessandy. Alessandy, huh? Mm -hmm. You mind if I call you Sandy? Sandy? It has a fair and winsome grace. Mm, so do you. You know, Sandy, you're, you're, you're quite a dish. Dish? Oh, I, I'm sorry, baby. If we're going to do much talking, I, I guess we better do it your way, huh? <laughs> would hold my hand? You're darn tootin' I would. Thou swell, thou witty, thou sweet, thou grand wouldst kiss me pretty, wouldst hold my hand, both thine eyes are cute to what they do to me. Hear me holler, I choose a sweet lollapalooza in thee. I'd feel so rich in a hut for two, two rooms. And kitchen, I'm sure would do. Give me just a plot of, not a lot of land. And thou swell, thou witty, thou grand. Fair night, thou speakest strangely, but somehow very pleasing to me. Could I try thy ballad? Forsooth, girl, forsooth. Thou swell, thou witty, thou sweet. Thou grand would kiss me pretty, would hold my hand. Both thine eyes are cute to what they do to me. Hear me holler, I choose a sweet lollipop loser in thee. Say, girl, 
Art sure thou hast never dug this jive before? Never, fair knight, never. Thou art certainly a very hep chick. <laughs> Give me just a plot of... Not a lot of land. And thou swell. Thou witty. Wouldst kiss me pretty. Thou swell. the captain. Is that the king, Sandy? Verily, tis King Arthur. And yonder beside him is the king's mighty and terrible magician. Mervyn. Yeah, he's a mighty terrible magician, all right. Not Mervyn, Merlin. Oh, he had to change his name, huh? Oh, king, and it please your majesty, we shall bring forth the fearsome fire-devouring dragon which hath been captured in the royal forest. Me? It pleaseth us, Merlin. Bring forth this monster. <laughs> Come, Varlet, kneel before the king. Who are you pushing? Who are you pushing? Uh, forsooth, he is a dreadful looking creature. Well, I've been sick. <laughs> How shall he be disposed of, your majesty? Well, let him be burned at the stake. Oh, now, wait a minute, fellas. Aren't you getting a little hasty with the hot foot? <laughs> he will burn at high noon. <laughs> Sandy. Yes. What's the date? November 27th. In the year 528? Yes. I remember reading in the World Almanac. Yeah. There was a total eclipse of the sun. Eclipse of the sun? Mm-hmm. What meaneth these strange words? Oh, you'll find out. Now, looky here, King. If you try to go ahead with this weenie roast, I'm going to have to get tough. <laughs> I'm going to blot out the sun. What's blot out the sun? Oh. Tis but idle chatter, O oh king. Even I, the mighty Merlin, cannot perform such magic. Oh, but say, it doth seem to grow darker. Look! The sun is swallowed up. Oh, 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 oh lackaday. What fearsome magic is this that taketh away the sun? Don't you move. I command. Stay where you are. You understand. If anyone stirs, yes, even the king, I'll blot out every man and thing. I'll break you asunder with lightning and thunder. I mean, I'll shoot the works. Stay thy hand, magician. Name thy terms, and I shall grant them to thee. Only give us back the sun. Okay, king old boy, here's the deal. From now on, I'm your prime minister. Granted. And my title shall be the boss. I dub thee the boss. And now we beg you, sweep away this night. Break the enchantment. I hope I can remember the magic words. Bibbidi, 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 sir. Gypsy Rose and Doris Day, Rudy Bing and Gordon McRae. Look! Oh, the sun! with the second act of Connecticut Yankee in just a moment.
Soon now, most of us will be wrapping gaily decorated Christmas parcels and mailing colorful Yuletide cards to friends and relatives all over the United States. It's always a good feeling to know that all the shopping is over and everything's in the mail, headed on the way to bring cheer in this joyous season of the year. From now until Christmas, the volume of mail is expected to reach more than six billion pieces, an all-time record of Yule mail. And, as is the case the year round, 99% of all mail moving from one city to another will be handled by the railroads. As the tide of mail begins to rise at Christmas time, it takes a lot of advanced planning and precision teamwork to make sure that the mail continues to move with the same dependability it does every other day and night of the year. Weeks ago, post office officials and railroad representatives met to lay careful plans for handling Christmas mail. Every phase of the plan was worked out. Adequate car supply, plenty of locomotives and switch engines, sufficient manpower, location of cars in advance where they will be available when needed, and all the other details required to move a mountain of mail in a short time. Now the railroads are at work carrying out the details of the plan. And as the mail starts to increase, they will run extra sections of trains and add extra cars to present trains. At busy terminals and stations all over the country, hour-to-hour developments will be carefully watched so that the flood of mail will continue to move. Yes, these are some of the reasons why the post office department and the railroads urge you to mail early this Christmas. And you can be sure that the all-season, all-weather railroads are doing everything possible to make certain that your parcels and cards are delivered to their destinations swiftly, dependably, safely. Here is Act Two of Connecticut Yankee, starring Gordon McRae as Hank and Ginny Sims as Sandy. plant, thou wilt manufacture a new automobile called the Guinevere 6 by order of Sir Boss. Go ahead, Sandy. Turn it on. And what dost thou call this miracle, good Sir Boss? It's just a radio. A radio? Mm Mm-hmm. I was going to invent television, but I decided to wait for color. (laughs) I uh, flip the switch, stop. Concluding our midday news card. This is NBC, the Middle Ages Broadcasting Company. Bud Bodkin! And now, the weather report, brought to you by Smiling Sir Geheris, maker of fine armor. Double-breasted chain mail with a pleat in the back. <laughs> Wears like iron. Oh, brother, what a dirty trick I'm playing on history. Sometimes I wonder, with all these magical contrivances... If thou wilt ever have time for me. Why, Sandy, I've been meaning to ask you. Will you be Mrs. Sir Boss? Oh, verily and forsooth. I hope that means yes. Oh, verily and forsooth. I feel at home with you. You always fit on the knees that you sit on. That's why I feel at home with you. place that we go, you flatter my ego. That's why I feel at home with you. I have a sensible, comprehensible, great respect for you. Hope a dash of it is a passionate, tender feeling too. You are a part of me, something that's giving me reason for living. That's why I feel at home with you. I feel at home with you. Your brain is dumber than that of a plumber. That's why I feel at home with you. Yeah, well, I'll match my dome with you. Your brain needs a tonic, it's still embryonic. That's why I feel at home with you. Our minds are featherweight, they're featherweight, can amount to mouth. You use the better words than three-letter words, dog and cat and son. So you have 
have no head at all. Something like your knob is used as a doorknob. That's why I feel at home with you. Oh, dear Sir Boss, sweet Sir Boss. Handsome Sir Boss. I never had it this good in Hartford. <laughs> Mr. Sagrimor, methinks I cannot endure all this progress. I, Merlin, one invention of Sir Boss hath proof my undoing. Ah, which? The bathtub. It hath washed away all my personality. <laughs> I have a plan to avenge ourselves upon this monster. Sir Boss is smitten with a damosel called Sandy. Now suppose I give her a magic potion which will make her love me. It is perfect to fall in love with thee. I can imagine no fate more horrible. Thank thou and good night, Sir Sagramor. Oh, behold, yonder is the maid. Ah, see her. She will shortly be thy bride. <laughs> And now, my pretty, thou shalt drink this love potion. I beseech thee, mighty Merlin, grant me one request before I drink. Let me bid farewell to Sir Boss. Oh, but Sir Boss is many leagues away. That is not possible. Canst thou loan me a nickel? A nickel? Thanks, Jack. Number for Sue. Camelot 96163. Ringing Camelot 961 Sir Boss speaking. Oh, good, Sir Boss. Sandy, is that you? I can't say very much. Merlin is right outside the phone booth listening. But can't you do a friend a favor? Uh, what is it, Sir Boss? Merlin has run off with my future wife. Oh, verily, I shall harness my galloping stallion and charge to the rescue. <laughs> now hold your horses, Art. We're riding the Camelot and South Wales Railroad. All aboard. <laughs> Surrender thou the damosel named Sandy, or Sir Boss will pulverize thee with a bazooka. <laughs> no, 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 no. Spare me, Your Majesty. Take the girl. Well, that's more like it. Oh, Sir Boss, bless thee for coming to my rescue. Hey, Sandy, why, why don't you open your eyes? I have drunk the love potion. I must needs be certain that the first mortal I do look upon shall be my own true love. 
Well, open your peepers, baby. Oh, fair, sir, boss. Dost thou love me? I do. I do. Truly, dost thou love me? I do. I do. I do. Very good. I now pronounce you man and wife. What is going on here, I'd like to know? Hey, wait a minute. That's Merlin. Not Merlin, Mervyn. What is this preacher doing here? According to the laws of this state, these two are now man and wife. What? We are? Of course. You were unconscious, but you said, I do, on the right time. <laughs> oh, verily. Verily, thou art a paragon of cleverness, fair damosel. Hank, what kind of talk is that? Well, Sandy, it's just an extra special way of saying, Thou swell. Thou with me. Thou sweet. Thou grand would kiss me pretty. Would hold my hand, both thine eyes are cute too. What they do to me. Hear me holler right through the street, la la the loser in me. You will be able to I feel so rich in a heart or two. Two rooms and kitchen, I'm sure would do. Give me just a plot of. of our guest star, Ginny Sims, Joe Kearns, Ed Begley, Marvin Miller, Katie Lee, and our entire company. A Connecticut Yankee with music by Richard Rogers, lyrics by Lorenz Hart, and book by Herbert Fields was dramatized for the Railroad Hour by Lawrence and Lee. The Railroad Hour is brought to you each week at this time by the American Railroads. This week is a big one for more than 1,200 boys and girls from farms all over the nation. For these young folks are meeting in Chicago for the annual Congress of the National 4-H Club, the organization which is improving farming and adding to human values in rural communities throughout America. The railroads are glad to have played a part in the development of the fine work being carried on by these farm boys and girls and will continue their cooperation in making more efficient producers and better businessmen of these farmers of tomorrow. Oh. Well, it looks as though we're ready to pull out. So until next week, when we present The Firefly with Miss Dorothy Sarnoff joining Mr. McRae in the charming Rudolph Frimmel music, goodbye. <laughs> Connecticut Yankee was presented by special arrangement with the Tams Whitmark Music Library. Gordon McRae can be seen starring in the Warner Brothers production, The West Point Story. Miss Ginny Sims can be heard every Sunday in her own program, The Botany Song Shop. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and our music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. This is Marvin Miller saying goodbye until next week for the American Railroad. And now keep tuned to your Monday night of music on NBC. Eleanor Stieber sings on The Voice of Firestone. Hear her on NBC.